Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about Valiant. Actually, let me take that back. I don't want to talk about Valiant. I wish I'd never heard of the company. I wish I'd never bought the company. But the reality is, it is perhaps the biggest loser. In fact, it's not even perhaps. It is the biggest loser in my portfolio. Now, part of me says, don't look at it. And if you don't look at it, it's going to go away. But the reality is, it's still going to be there. So for better or worse, let's go. So let's take a look back at Valiant. My interest in Valiant came uh, came about in November of 2015. In fact, for much of Valiant's glory days, which lasted from 2010 through 2015, where it became the darling for every value investor on the face of the earth, the favorite stock for many of these investors, I wasn't in the least bit interested. But in November of 2015, the stock had dropped about 80% from its peak. In fact, not quite that much. The peak was about 250 and it dropped about $80. And I got interested. I just wanted to see whether, in fact, the drop was justified. So I made my first attempt to value Valiant. Now, to give you some perspective, Valiant in its glory days had set up a business model that was fairly unique for a pharmaceutical company. They grew, but they grew by acquiring other companies, not through R&D. And after they acquired these other companies, usually with a lot of debt, they would take the drugs that these other companies had, which were low-priced drugs, which were underpriced drugs, drugs where you could push up the price and they would push up the price. Now, you can say it's legally defensible, morally a little questionable, but a business model that nevertheless worked for them as long as they stayed under the radar. Now, what caused the collapse in November of 2015 is they no longer could stay under the radar for multiple reasons. Some of their mistakes became obvious for people to see, including the fact that the online pharmacy Philidor that they used was not quite set up right. Some of it came from the fact that they'd become just too big. And when you get big, things you do that you used not to see noticed now start to get noticed. In particular, their acquisition of Salix, a large pharmaceutical company, made their small decisions into big decisions. Whatever the reason, when I looked at them in November of 2015 and I looked at their business model, acquisitions funded with debt, raise prices after, my conclusion was they could not go back to the mo um, to that model, partly because now that the light was sh shining on them, they could no longer do the things they used to do. So in November of 2015, my first attempt to value Valiant, I assumed that it will, beco it will become, almost instantaneously, a mature, it start behaving more like a traditional pharmaceutical company. What does that mean? It'll try to create growth with R&D, but because it's in a mature business, its growth rate would become a much lower growth rate. It would continue to be a profitable company because it wouldn't need to be pumping in things on acquisition costs and write-offs of goodwill and the other costs were dragging its operating income down. So I gave it a low growth rate, pretty hefty margins, and I valued the stock at about 77. Remember, what drew my attention to Valiant was the fact that the stock price had dropped to 80. But at 77, my conclusion was, hey, with the new business model in place, the, now that the market recognized they cannot go back to the old model, well, 80 doesn't look like a bargain to me, so I left the stock alone. I wish I could tell you I'd left it alone for the rest of eternity, but I did not. Because a few months later, in April of 2016, I went back to value. Why? Because the stock had had trouble. In those six months, it went through a myriad of problems. Some were mostly self-inflicted. First, the CEO got sick, went into the hospital. They were without a top management team. They had accounting issues that led them to delay their earnings report, which is supposed to come out in February and kept getting delayed. And that's never good news. Essentially, there was an information vacuum. Management had disappeared. And I said, you know what? I want to revalue the company. I revalued it again, it's still as a mature drug company, but I updated the numbers to reflect the fact that when the new numbers came out, they revealed some truths about about their past that made them a less profitable company. So I said, okay, the bad news is out. You got a new management, Joe Papa coming in. So now you can start from scratch. You're going to be a boring drug company. And I revalued them on that basis with a much lower earnings, a low growth rate and R&D driving growth again at about $43.56. The stock was down to about 32 when I did this. And I just, at that point in time, I said, you know what, the stock looks cheap to me. I'm going to buy shares in the stock. So that was in April of 2016. And those of you who followed the stock know that nothing good came after that. The stock continued to drop. It dropped to 25, and then 24, then 20. And finally, in November of 2016, the stock was down to about $14 after its earnings report. And I said, 
you know what I have to take a look at this train accident on my in my portfolio so I took another look at Valiant and and now I saw some serious deterioration in the operating numbers and my conclusion was that transition I assume would be painless from acquisitive growth company to traditional pharmaceutical company was clearly a little more painful than I thought it was and I tried to build it into my intrinsic valuation how by giving them essentially no growth for the next two years and essentially letting them grow to that even the three percent anemic growth rate so I made, brought the growth rate down to zero flat revenues for the next two years and allowed for the margins to improve a little bit because they had reported some one-time losses or one-time charges supposedly that dropped their operating income. I valued the company at about $32.50. Stock was at 50. I very seldom double down on my investments. That seems to sign of hubris when you do. But perhaps I was struck by that curse of hubris because I doubled down for one of the few times. I said, look, you know, if I buy a stock because it looks cheap, the stock looks really cheap to me. So I doubled my holding in value in November of 2016 when the stock was at about 14. So at this stage, I've doubled the holdings I did six months prior, and the average price is around 21. So I sat back and waited for the stock price to go to 32.50. Now it looks like I'll be waiting a long time since, because since November of 2016, the pain has continued. In fact, in the most recent earnings report that came out a few weeks ago, the company reported that revenues were continuing to decline, operating margins were still dropping, interest expense was up, even though they'd managed to pay down about a billion and a half of their debt. So the company has slightly less debt, is less profitable, and is still going through pains in trying to get its revenues back to what a traditional drug company would have. So now I'm faced with a question, what do I do now? So I have to revisit the valuation, and as I look at Valiant now, I'm wondering whether this transition back to being a traditional pharmaceutical company is at risk. And here's why. Valiant, during its glory days, set up a model that was, as I said, legally defensible perhaps, but morally questionable. A model of acquiring other companies with debt. That part is okay, but then raising prices on drugs. And that part of the model was always a little questionable, even though, as I said, it might be legally defensible because it exposes you to predatory pricing criticism. And, and Valiant, by... 2016 and 2017 had damaged itself from that and the question was how deep was the damage and I perhaps have underestimated the depth of the damage all the way through but it looks like the damage is deeper and more difficult to get back from so when I revalued Valiant in March of 2017 I decided to extend the period that will take them to get out of this pain. And there's now a very real chance that they might not be able to make it, that they're so damaged. They're da damaged in what sense? You know, they, there was a news story that said that they were having a tough time building their R&D department because you've got to hire scientists. And if you're a scientist who used to work for Merck and Valiant calls you, you're not exactly excited about returning that call. They were having trouble with any kind of pricing increases because they were so tarred as the bad guys in this process, but that any time they announced they were going to try to increase prices, they got pushed back. They even had trouble selling off their biggest assets, which are Bausch and Long and Salix. And at least at Salix, the problem seemed to be that the people who are potential buyers didn't seem to trust value. So in many ways, their years of glory might have damaged them so much that it's difficult for them to do the transition that I that I proposed for them in the previous valuations. Undaunted, I built it in, and this time I built even more pain. I assume that revenues, instead of being flat, would now continue to drop 2% a year for the next five years. And after that, the company would make the transition back to this 3% growth rate. So I'm not even telling you a glorious story. This is a story of pain followed by boredom. And that's assuming the company makes it. I revalued the company. I kept the probability of default at 10%, partly because they managed to bring the debt down and partly because that no longer seems to be the central issue with Valiant, whether they'll go bankrupt, which was over their heads a year ago. I revalued the company. I came up with a value of $13.68. That's down almost 70% from the $32.50. Now, if you look at the stock price, though, but you know, it says it was $12 at the time that I did this. By the time I'm doing this webcast, it's down to $10.60 or 70 cents. 
at 1070, if, the, if my value is not even right, as a number that I can have faith in, then at 1070, I should be holding the stock, right? Now, of course, there is this one other news story that happened last week that you're saying, why are you ignoring that? But before I go there, let me emphasize that the 1368 that I got is an expected value based on assumptions that could very well be wrong or wrong. Well, I tried to do what-if analyses, not even what-if analyses, simulations, where I essentially built in probability distributions for three big assumptions. One is revenue growth for the first five years. Remember, I used to minus 2%. Well, that could be, uh, I allowed it to vary from minus 6 to plus 2. Essentially, the expected value is still plus minus 2, but there can be a range around the revenue growth. I assume margins might actually continue to drop down to 25% at one end, or perhaps the optimistic scenario, they bounce back to what they used to be before the trouble started. And the cost of capital of 9%, again, I allowed to be a distribution. With those distributions built in, I ran a series of simulations and I ran a million simulations, right? Sounds like a lot of work, but if you have crystal ball, which is what I use to run the simulations, it takes like five minutes to do. Here's a distribution of values. So what am I learning from this? First, you're getting confirmation of what the base case valuation gave you. The median value that I got across a million simulations was about 1331, you see. Why do we waste our time if the value is going to be roughly what it was in the base case? I do learn a little bit more about my own stock, right? There's now about, you know, based on these simulations, about a 12% chance that the value of my assets, the operating asset value, could be less than my debt, which effectively makes my equity worth nothing. It's about a 12% chance my stock could go to zero. Does that scare me? No, once it's dropped this much, you know, what's, what's another, you know, another drop to zero? And at the other end of the extreme, it get, does give you the potential for good news, which is if the company can turn itself around and become a conventional you know, drug company. Again, okay, not a very exciting story, but a boring, profitable story. They could be worth $35 or $40 per share. So at least or based on my intrinsic valuation and looking at the stock price, here are the three things to factor in. You know, you can look at where you can either sell the stock and say, I've lost too much money. You can hold the stock saying, hey, something good can happen. Or you could actually think of it as a fresh buy that you've sold and bought back. But before I do that, I do want to talk a little bit about one big news story that you might have read about value, which is that Bill Ackman, who's been the company's biggest investor and biggest cheerleader and a board member for the last couple of years, has sold his stake in Valiant or Pershing Square, which is his, uh, which is the fund that he runs. It's taken Valiant for about eleven dollars per share. So he's lost a staggering ninety percent on this investment and perhaps a big chunk of his reputation. Now he's saying if he sells, isn't that something you should be factoring into your investment? Now don't get me wrong. I think Bill Ackman is a very shrewd investor, notwithstanding this mistake. And when he says I'm going to buy or sell short something, I always listen. But I did not buy Valiant because Ackman owned Valiant, and I'm not going to sell it just because he sells it. Because if I did that, I wouldn't be an intrinsic value investor. I'd be a me too investor. In fact, in a strange way, Ackman's exit might allow the company more freedom to explore its options, to do things it could not have done while he was on the board. Because Ackman is human to the extent that he bought the stock when the stock price was 180, 200, or 220, he has anchors in his mind that might prevent the company or that might induce him to stop the company from doing things that are actually in their best interest today. Like what? As I see it, there are three paths forward for value. The first is my going concern assumption, where the company continues to have troubles, and but ultimately makes that transition to becoming a boring, profitable drug company. The value that I get per share is about $13.68. It could be an acquisition target. Perhaps there's somebody out there who wants to buy value, warts and all. I am not hopeful about this because I'm afraid that the taint of the company name is such that nobody wants to deal with the mess you're going to get, or they think they're going to get when they buy the company which leaves you with a third option. And I think as, as, as an investor in value, this may be my most, potentially at least, my most attractive option. Valiant has some valuable pieces to the company. I talked about Bausch & Lomb, I talked about Salix. Now, hitherto they've had trouble selling those pieces, but that's because they want to sell them as a continuing company selling the pieces. And many buyers are holding back saying, I don't know what you're, what you're hiding from me. Perhaps it's time for value to open its books, let everybody see what's in there, what's and all, and 
put the entire company in pieces up for sale, not to one buyer for all of the pieces, but to the best best potential buyer for each piece. So Bausch & Lomb, you 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 auction off to the best potential buyer. Salix, you auction off to the and you do that with every single asset. I you know I, I don't know enough about the insides of these businesses. I know there are some numbers floating around that people are throwing around. But to the extent that the liquidation value exceeds $29 billion, equity is going to be worth nothing. And if it exceeds $35 or $36 billion, the total liquidation value, you're going to start to exceed the $13.68 I got as a going concern value. And I have a suspicion that the liquidation value might actually be greater than the going concern value. So here's where I am. Here's the test I should be running, and I, I don't claim to be completely clean about running this test. When I look at my portfolio, the question I have to ask with every single investment there, no matter how well or badly it's done in the past, is if I looked at this stock today, at today's price, would I buy it? Now, I cannot reverse my original sin. My original sin was when I bought the stock in April of 2016 at 32. I doubled down on that sin by doubling my holding in November of 2000. I can't get those that money back. So the question I have to ask is at today's price, which at this at the time that I'm looking at this, you know, after I've done the analysis, about eleven dollars per share or ten seventy per share, would I buy the stock? And the answer there is if I believe my own valuation, you know, and if I don't believe my own valuation, why bother? Why do a valuation if you don't believe your own valuation? The answer is I would probably buy it. Wouldn't be first on my list, but it's cheap on an intrinsic value basis. Now I'll also tell you my caveat. I know that in behavioral finance, one of investing's biggest sins is loss aversion, that you're unwilling to, I'm, I'm sorry, not loss aversion, but the unwillingness to sell losers in your portfolio. And the reason is simple. When you sell something, it's the ultimate admission that you made a mistake. And by not selling it, you're essentially avoiding admitting to it. I'm hoping that I'm not falling into that same trap. And you're saying, how do you know I don't? The, here's the problem with 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 having a blind spot as an investor. You as an investor, when you have a blind spot, you're always the last person to know. So for all I know, I'm letting that 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 delusion push me to come up with a value higher than the price. And to counter it, here's what I'm hoping I can offer you as my defense. The first is, I'm not holding value on the expectation that I'll make my average price back. My average price in the stock is about 21 to $22. I don't think I'll make it back. I even briefly considered selling the stock right now, admitting to the mistake, and then buying it back again. The, the reason I did not do that is there's a, there's, there's a wash sale rule in the, uh, that the IRS uses where if you sell a stock and buy it back, you're not allowed to claim the losses that you had on the sale. So I can't quite do that. So I'm not sure that I'm not deluding myself. I will never be sure. But for the moment, I'm continuing to hold the stock. I would not, so please don't take it as a recommendation. It's not my job to convince other people to hold on to the stock. So if you're going to hold on to the stock, you need to look inwards at your own motives as to why you're holding the stock. I've looked and for the moment, I'm okay. But who knows? Six months from now, you might see my final blog post in value. And it might say the stock price just went to zero. That was the biggest mistake I made. But that happens. It happens. Thank you very much for listening.